This sermon is titled Hosea, the Faithfulness of God. Be enriched as you listen. All right. We're going to spend time in God's Word. And please turn with me to the book of Hosea. Where is it? It's somewhere right after Daniel. You know, these are parts of our Bible we probably don't tread through very often, maybe once a decade or something. But the book of Hosea comes right after Daniel, towards the latter part of the Old Testament. So, I want us to just share some of the key things from this book, the book of Hosea. And uh, uh, in order for us to understand and just get into what this book brings out to us. Why is this book in the Bible? What is God communicating? What did He communicate to His people back then? And what is He communicating to us today through this book, the book of Hosea. That's what we want to talk about uh, this morning. Now, just a a little bit of history. I I don't know if you like history. I know some people have left the church because I taught history. (laughs) I remember a long time ago, we were doing a series on the end times, and we did two sermons, one on the history on the Middle East and one on the history of the nation of Israel, kind of so that you understand the Bible prophecy. And then one young man left the church, and I met him a long time ago after that. I said, why did you stop coming to church? He said, because you were talking history. You told me that, okay? Because I don't want to come to church and learn history. But look, Bible history is so important because you understand, the, you will correctly understand the present and interpret the present correctly if you understand the history. And many times we incorrectly interpret the present because we don't understand history. So history is very important. So very quickly, very briefly, just give us the context for the book of Hosea, the Bible history for this book. Now, we all are aware that when when the people of Israel were brought out of Egypt and they came into the land of Canaan, at some point they all said, look, we want a king. And so we had King Saul, the first king of Israel. Israel. Then we had King David, and then we had King Solomon. Now, the son of Solomon was, uh, okay, I'm not going to remember these names, I'm very, uh, uh, Jeroboam, he, he became king, taking over from Solomon. And when Jeroboam took over, this was around 930 BC, the, the nation of Israel became a divided kingdom. So from that point on till today, actually Israel is a divided nation. Meaning what happened? When Jeroboam took over, the son of Solomon took over, there was another man, Rehoboam, who, let me get the, make sure I'm getting these names right. Sorry, Rehoboam, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon and Jeroboam was the one who rebelled. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So he rebelled against <laughs> these names, against Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon. Looking at my Bible, so I get the names right. So Jeroboam rebelled against Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, 930 BC, and took 10 tribes with him. So these 10 tribes, the northern part of Israel. So northern Israel was divided. So Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, starting from 930 BC onwards. So the northern kingdom, often in the Bible, from that point on, the northern kingdom is called the kingdom of Israel or Israel or Jacob or Ephraim. The southern kingdom had two tribes, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, And uh, they remain faithful to the house of David. And they are often referred to in the Bible from that point on as Judah. So in the Bible, when you're reading, God says to Judah, he's speaking to these two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin. When he's speaking to Israel, he's speaking to this northern kingdom, the ten tribes that separated away from the southern kingdom. You all with me so far? Right? Now, this king, the the first king of the northern kingdom, who was uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, what he did was when he separated, he introduced his own gods. So what he did was he created high places all across the northern kingdom, which was a big part of, big chunk of Israel. He created high places 
Anybody who wanted to pre be a priest, he appointed them as priests. He appointed himself as a high priest. He made altars and he made a calf, a calf as, as the object of worship. His intent was he didn't want people to go back to Jerusalem to worship God. That's what he did. And very interesting, when you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, this sin of Jeroboam is referred to, I mean, it's, it, he became iconic for his sin. It was referred to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And all other kings were compared to him. Did they sin as much as him? You know, so he made the highest standard for sin by what he did. Right? But his intent was keep the people away from going to Jerusalem. Right? So that, that happened all in 930 BC. Now we traverse through time and we come to the... So Hosea the prophet was prophesying in the northern kingdom of Israel... At that time, there was another king. His name was also Jeroboam, but now he was identified as Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So it's a different Jeroboam, or you can put Jeroboam the second. Right? So it's a different Jeroboam. He's not the same king. But while Hosea was prophesying, this king, Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, continued in the sins of his forefather. That means Israel was still that land that was sinning against God, they departed from God and they're worshiping this calf and other gods that had been introduced. Now Judah had four other kings during the time of Hosea, and, and you find these, the king, names of these kings in Hosea chapter 1 verse 1. Uh, he, uh, he mentions Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, these other four kings. To some degree, they tried to keep the people uh, you know, in faith in God, with faith in God. So Judah was more or less faithful. Israel completely departed from God. That was the time when Hosea was prophesying. You all with me so far? Right? And uh, uh, Hosea was a contemporary of other prophets that you'll recognize. Isaiah, Amos, Micah. They all were contemporaries prophesying around the same time. This was around the 8th century BC. Right? Now, just to give quickly history what happened... Uh, Hosea was prophesying, warning the people of all their sin. Shortly after that, Assyria, uh, which would be the, uh, a tribe which would be occupying in today's modern-day Iraq, north northeastern part, came in and they overpowered, they took over, destroyed Israel, took a lot of them as captives. So they are referred to as the ten lost tribes because Assyrians came in, conquered them, and basically uh, took a lot of those people away into that region. So today when we talk about Jews, or in the New Testament, we talk about Jews, we're really referring to the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So that's what, when you talk about Jews, you're roughly referring to those two tribes. When you talk about Israel, you're referring to, of course, all the 12 tribes. Later on, the Babylonians came and attacked Judah and destroyed Judah. So you remember Nebuchadnezzar came, destroyed Judah, uh, Jerusalem, and took them away. So both these portions, kingdoms of Israel, uh, of Israel, suffered at the hands of their enemies as, as a way of God's judgment in their lives. So Hosea is prophesying. And so let's talk a little bit about the prophet Hosea. So when he's prophesying, uh, he, he is referring to what is happening in Israel, primarily in Israel. He does speak to Judah as well. And he's saying, you know, there, this, the people are in, uh, the, God calls it harlotry, spiritual harlotry. That means they have wandered away from God. So the prophet Hosea is speaking and he's saying, you know, uh, the people of the land have committed harlotry. Harlotry. They wandered away from God. There was a spirit of harlotry that has captured or influenced these people. And he, uh, he highlights, you know, some of those things. Now, that's the, not the main intent, but I'm just giving us a little background here. You know, he talks about the fact that these people, there is no truth or no mercy. Uh, there is no knowledge of God. And uh, 
they have ceased obeying God. Uh, their other things are enslaving their heart, like wine and whatever other things are enslaving their heart. Uh, they are seeking guidance from other sources instead of seeking guidance from God. And uh, they do not turn toward God. So this is the spiritual condition of Israel, primarily as a nation, as well as part some of people in Judah. They, he calls it spiritual holiday. People have departed from God. So in this context, God tells Hosea, he says, I want you to go marry a person. She's called Gomer. And uh, uh, they have three children, two boys and a girl. And God says, you know, call each one by a particular name. And each name is speaking a message to the people of Israel. And then what happens? Gomer abandons Hosea. She wanders off with other lovers. But God tells Hosea, I want you to go and redeem her back, buy her back, redeem her back to yourself and make her, uh, get her to make a contract that she will never leave you again. And so this whole, his whole life, him marrying Gomer, the three children, and then him, Gomer leaving, and him going back and getting Gomer back to himself becomes a prophetic message to the nation of Israel. Are you with me? So, just as a side note, it's not the main theme here, this becomes a prophetic sign. And there are times in your life and mine that God can use certain things or certain people or certain circumstances as a prophetic sign. So we need to be aware of it, but don't be obsessed with it. Right? Oh, a cat crossed my road. This is a sign. No, that's not a sign. That's a superstition. <laughs> right? So, I want us to be open that God can give us signs, prophetic messages through the people, through the situations we face. You know, be open to it because that's what he did in this case. He used uh, Hosea and his whole family and what happened to his family as a prophetic sign to the nation of Israel. So we are open to prophetic signs, but don't be obsessed with it. Don't think every little thing is a sign. Discern. Most importantly, listen to the Holy Spirit. But I want to bring out the main theme of this book. What is God getting across to the people? He wants His people to know that He is so committed to them, so faithful to them, that even if they wander away, He's still coming after them. And so, I've put down this outline and these four points, which I'll just highlight today. The call of God to a wandering soul. Secondly, the goodness of God to a wandering soul. The heart of God toward a wandering soul. And the promise of God to a wandering soul. These are the four things we're going to see. Now, I've personalized it or individualized it because I know God is speaking to a nation, but a nation is made up of people. It's made up of individuals. And so today, I want to just highlight that, bring it as a message to you and me as individuals. Are you listening so far? So what do we see in the book of Hosea? The call of God to a wandering soul. There are two key words that really stand out, that are repeated in this book. One is return. Another one is seek. So the prophet's message to the people is return to God. Seek God throughout this book. And I'm just going to highlight a few verses. We, of course, don't have time to read everything in these 14 chapters. Just highlighting. Please look, at, look with me to Hosea chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3. And, of course, these will come up on the screen as well. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. So, Hosea's message, come, let us return to God. He's a good God. 
he will restore us. Let us return. Again in Hosea 14, verse 1 and 2. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. So the call again, return to the Lord. A second key word in the message, God's message to a wandering soul is seek. Hosea 10 and verse 12. I'm just picking up one verse. This, it's used many times in, this, in these 14 chapters. Just looking at one verse. Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So Hosea's message to the people. It is time to seek the Lord. Amen? And for some of us, maybe it's a reminder. It is time to seek the Lord. I feel like I'm not preaching this to us as though all of us are people who wandered away from God. Obviously not. The fact that you are here this morning is because there is a, a desire in all of our hearts to continue seeking God. But if there is somebody, or if you feel like, you know, I'm not where I should, should be spiritually. You know, maybe for some reason, just become too busy with life, busy with things. And if you feel, I'm not where I'm supposed to be today, spiritually. Hey, look, return, seek. Return to God. His arms are always open. Seek. That means an intentional pursuit of God. Making an effort to intentionally go after God. Seek. It is time to seek. And notice how, what the prophet says. It is time to seek Him. Till He comes. See? Now, you know, you know, when you play hide and seek, the obvious picture in our minds is the person whom you are seeking is hiding. Now, in this case, God is not hiding away from us, but He's hiding in order for us to seek Him so that when we find Him, it'll be finding Him alone, not lost in the crowd. Are you with me? He's not in the crowd. Oh God, no. He's hiding somewhere. Meaning he's not in the crowd. He's somewhere else. So when you find him, you'll find him alone. That's what he wants. Seek him. You know, return, seek. Seek him till he comes. How long must I seek God? Until you find him. Until you encounter him. Until you know that things are happening in your life. Till he comes and rains righteousness on us. God is beginning to work in your life. Seek him till then. So two key words. Now, a couple of other things in the context of returning and seeking is, uh, let, let, let's, let me just remind you of this, remind us of this promise. In Jeremiah 29 verse 13, Jeremiah 29 13, this Jeremiah is saying, you know, he's speaking to the people again. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So seek me, you will find me. But you've got to search for me with all your heart. That's what God wants. Pursue me with all your heart. Not a half-hearted, my mother is telling me to do this kind of pursuit. No, it's got to come from you. It's got to come from your heart. Amen? Now, what's interesting is, in the context of returning and seeking, I want to point our attention to Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. It's, it's really touching. Hosea 5, verse 15. Here's what God says. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And look what God is saying. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to go back and sit down. I'm going to go back to my place. 
let them recognize their offense and let them come seek me. And notice what he says. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Now remember, their affliction is self-inflicted. Because they wandered away from God and went on into all these things. It's not like God is putting that affliction on them. It, it, it was something they caused. They brought upon themselves. The Assyrians eventually came and overpowered them. But God is saying, I'm going to be here waiting for them. I'm waiting for them to come. To understand their wrongdoing. And then come seek me. But he's waiting. Amen? He's waiting. He's not withdrawn in the sense of, I don't want anything more to do with you. He's withdrawn in the sense that, I hope you come to your senses and then come back. Are you understanding? He's not withdrawn in, give, give, in a sense of giving up on you and me. He's waiting. So we come to our senses and then we earnestly seek Him. Another thing I want to highlight here in this returning and seeking is what we just read in Hosea 14 and verse 2. The prophet says, take words with you and return to the Lord. Take what? Did you read it correctly? Take what? 100 pieces of silver? 200 grams of gold? Take what? Say it again. What? Think of it. He's saying, take words and return to God. In other words, you know, when, when we want to return to God, he's saying, all I want is your heartfelt words. Words that come out of a genuine heart. That's all I want. I'm not asking you for money, a sacrifice, and this. And no, I just want to hear you speak from your heart. Take words with you. In fact, he even tells them what to say. Oh God, forgive us. Oh God, and we'll mention this a little later. We, we turn away from Assyria and Egypt and our gods and we turn to you. So those words, heartfelt words, that's all he's asking. And he calls that the sacrifice of lips. So when we want to turn to God, all he's asking is, talk to me from your heart. Be sincere in your words. That's it. That's all I want. I'm going to ask you anything else. Take words. The sacrifice of your lips and go to God. God, I am sorry. God, I messed up. Or God, I, I, I am not where I should be. Those sincere words is all God wants to hear. Can you imagine? Returning to God is not a difficult thing. We think, oh man, Ah, oh, it's going to cost me so much. It's going to be so expensive. It's going to be so much. All he's saying is take words and return. Just tell me from your heart that you want to come back. Just tell me from your heart that, you know, what you feel. That's all I want to hear. I don't think anybody can say it's really difficult to return to God. Nobody can say that. Because all that God asks is, Take words, the sacrifice of your lips, and come back to me. The second point we want to talk about is the goodness of God to a wandering soul. You know, what is God feeling towards you and me when we are actually wandering away from Him? The goodness of God to a wandering soul. And again, another word that we find often in the book is the word wilderness. Look with me to Hosea 2 and verse 14. God says, like he's talking about their sins. He says, this is what the nation is doing. But here's what he responds with. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. 
What's God saying? I will allure her. I will entice her. To where? Coffee day. <laughs> to where? Into the wilderness. Why? So that I can speak comfort to her or some translations. I will speak to her heart. So think of what God does to us. Think about his goodness. He's saying, these people are wandering away from me, but I'm going to bring them into the wilderness so that I can speak into their hearts. Wilderness. The wilderness is a place of solitude. We're alone with God. Sometimes you're forced to be alone with God. The wilderness is a place of silence, quietness, serenity. Because God wants you and me to listen to Him. The wilderness is a place of separation. You're separated from everything else. You can't depend on anything else. There's, you're, you can only depend on God. The wilderness is a place of strengthening. God strengthens you there. Are you listening? But this is the, an expression of the goodness of God. Why? Why does He entice us into the wilderness? Because He wants to speak to us. He wants us to be in that place of solitude, the place of silence, the place of separation, and the place of strengthening. Amen? Now sometimes, in our journey, we find ourselves in wilderness. Meaning, I'm not talking necessarily about, you know, the physical thing, but in your experience, you're going through, Lord, I'm alone. I'm so quiet here. Where are all my friends? They all disappear. It's solitude, it's silence, nobody's around, separated, forced to depend only on God, or, and it's that place where God is speaking to your heart, strengthening you. Are you listening? So God is saying, these people are wandering away from me, but I'm going to entice them into the wilderness so that I can speak to their heart. And I'll just reference a few couple of more verses here in Hosea about the wilderness. Hosea 9 verse 10, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Grapes in the wilderness. Something beautiful in a very unusual place. But God says, so what is that? God is expressing His delight in His people. Even though they feel like I'm in the wilderness, God says, hey, I'm having a great time with you. <laughs> I found grapes. I found them like grapes in the wilderness. Another place in Hosea 13 verse 5, He says, I knew you in the wilderness in the land of great drought. So things were rough for them, but God says, I knew you in that place. God knows you when you're in the wilderness. Are you with me so far? Some of, some of, some of you are lost somewhere in history. <laughs> Number three, the heart of God towards the wandering swan. This is the main part of the message. The heart of God to a wandering soul. And this is in Hosea chapter 11. We're going to read this whole chapter. It's a short chapter. But, you know, in this chapter, God is expressing His heart. I think chapter 11 of Hosea is the high point of this book. It's the key message. So please read with me, Hosea chapter 11. We're going to go through all of the verses. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So think about God speaking. Now he's speaking as a father would speak to a child. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Now, of course, the latter part of that verse is also used in reference to Jesus. Verse 2, verse 2 to 7. 
as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim, Israel, that's the same 10 tribes you're referring to. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king. So he's warning, look, Assyria is going to come and destroy you because they refuse to repent. And the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts and consume them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. I want you to feel the heart of God. God says, I loved him like a child. I called him. I taught him to walk. I took him by his hands. I healed him. I drew him with cord, gentle cords, verse 4, with bands of love. I stooped and fed him. Think about this. The picture of a father taking care of a son or a child. God says, that's how I dealt with my people. But they still went away. After all these false gods, they went, wandered away. See the heart of God. So what, does, what, what happens next? Verse 8. Look at this verse. How can I give you up, Ephraim? That's Israel. How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. So God is saying, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? Now, Adma and Zebulun were cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's referring to those cities. In other words, I can't even destroy you the way I destroyed those terrible cities. I can't do that for you. My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. Are you listening? Are you listening? What is God saying? He's saying, my people, how can I give, you, give up on you? How can I abandon you? How can I destroy you? I can't do it. If you look at the last part of that verse in some modern versions, they render it like this. The contemporary English version says, I just can't do it. My feelings for you are much too strong. The English Standard Version says, My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. The Message Bible. I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insides churn in protest. The Good News Bible. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. What do you think about yourself today? What do you think God feels for you today? Maybe you wandered from God. He dealt with you and me so lovingly, so compassionately, as a father deals with a child. And, you know, maybe we're unfaithful. Maybe we did things, you know, whatever. What, how do you think God feels towards you today? I want to show you one thing. God will not, cannot, abandon you. He says, I love you too much. I just can't do it. Are you understanding it? That's the heart of God towards a wandering soul. He says, I love you too much. I just can't do this. My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. My love for you is too strong. Verse 9. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. He says, I am God, I am not man. Man has only so much he can take. God says, I am God, 
I'm not man. Man may make a promise, he may fail to keep it. But God says, when I make a covenant, I'm staying with it. God, man gives you a word, he may not have the capacity to fulfill it. God says, I give you my word, I'm more than able to fulfill it. I am God, not man. That's why I'm going to stay faithful to you. That's why I'm going to love you no matter what. I am God, not man. Next few verses. It says, verse 11, They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land. Sorry, verse 10. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. God says, I'm going to roar. You know, God roars. <laughs> God says, I'm going to roar like a lion. What does that mean? When a lion roars, he's expressing his dominion, authority. He's the king of the jungle. So God says, I'm going to display my dominion and authority. And when my, my people see my greatness, they will come to me. Amen. So God says, I'm going to display my greatness. So that his, he will draw his people back to himself. Verse 10, which we just read. Verse 11. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in the houses, says the Lord. Ephraim has encircled me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah walks with God, even with the Holy One who is faithful. I want to emphasize this part. The Holy One who is faithful. Let's all say this together. The Holy One who is faithful. Say it again. The Holy One who is faithful. That's a very important word. Faithful is a very important word in the book of Hosea. God says, I am God. I am the Holy One who is faithful. He says, my people, Israel, has surrounded me with lies and with deceit. But I am faithful. The Holy One who is faithful. That's the message of this book, the book of Hosea. God says, I am God. I am the Holy One who is faithful. And I want to impress that on your heart and mine. That God is faithful. He is God. And He's the Holy One who is faithful. He's faithful to you. Even when we have been faithless. And Paul writes this in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 2.13. He says, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. Have you had those moments when you felt faithless? I want you to know, God's remained faithful to you. Even in those moments. He cannot deny himself. He's God. He cannot change his promise. He cannot change his word. Amen. The last thing I just want to quickly highlight, number four, is a promise of God to a wandering soul. That's chapter 14. So what's he saying? I'm going to read this chapter, Hosea 14, 1 through 9. O Israel, return to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. So what must you say to him? Take away all sin. Receive us graciously. For we will offer the sacrifice of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. Nor will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. For in you the fatherless find mercy. So he's saying these are the words what God wants you to say. What, is, what, do you want, what does he want us to say? Remove all sin. Receive us graciously. And God, we're not going to depend on our horses. We're not going to depend on the work of our hands. We're not going to depend on the Assyrians. No, we're turning away from all this. We're turning to you. And how does, what is God's promise to them? Verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. 
I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a wine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what am I to do anymore with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. God is telling him, your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Worship team, please come. Notice what God tells his people. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will heal. Whatever has caused you and me to wander away, God says, I will heal it. I will love them freely. Love you freely. Unconditionally. Faithful love. My anger is turned away. God's not angry with you. He's not mad. His anger is turned away. And he says, I will be like the dew to Israel. In the next few verses, he says, basically, he's going to restore you. He's going to renew you. And uh, your fragrance and everything that was good about you is going to come back. And he says, even people will come back to you. Those who were with you before and abandoned you, they'll be back. Everything will be restored in your life. Are you listening? So that's the promise of God to our wandering soul. He says, now you return to the Lord. You bring those words. Say, God, I'm sorry. I'm turning away. I'm renouncing these things and I'm turning to you. God says, look, I will heal your backsliding. I will love you freely. I will restore everything. I'll restore you know, all the glory and the grandeur that you had. I will bring it back to you. People will come back to you. Amen. I wanted to highlight the last verse before we close. Hosea 14 verse 9. It seems like this verse is telling us the whole purpose of this book. It says, who is wise? Let him understand these things. So Hosea is saying, hey, I've told you all these things because I want you to understand. Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know these things. For the ways of the Lord are right, the righteous walk in them. So this book is unveiling to us the ways of the Lord so that you and I can walk in it. What do we know about God? He's faithful. What do we see about God in the book of Hosea? A faithful God. A God who loves freely. A God who speaks to us even in our wilderness. A God who says, I will heal, I will restore, I will bring back your glory. And Verse 9 says, if you're wise, you'll understand these things, you will know these things, and you will follow God in His ways. You will, you and I, will embody this God to people. We will be like this to others. Amen? We're going to take a few moments to pray. If there's anything in this overview of this book of Hosea that's spoken to your heart, I want you to talk to God about it. Say, God, I came this morning. And this is what I feel you're speaking to me today. Some of us may be in a place where we need to return and seek God. If you need to do that, take words. Your heart words, the words from your heart, talk to Him. That's what he wants to hear. If you feel like you're in a wilderness, remember 
God says, in the wilderness, I will speak to your heart. This time in the wilderness is your time with God. He delights in you like grapes found in the wilderness. He knows you. He's speaking to you. For all of us, we can have this assurance that our God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, He remains faithful. You can have that assurance. We all have our moments of weakness and we may not have lived up to the way to what we know we should have lived up, but our God is faithful. He does not abandon us. And I want you to have that assurance in your heart. God is faithful to you. Father, we pray this morning, God, that each of our hearts will connect with you. In whatever way we need to connect, in whatever way, whatever you want to speak to us, may we hear. May we be encouraged, may we be strengthened, may we be assured of that that the Holy One is faithful. You are God, you are not man. God is faithful. God is faithful. We're going to Take a few moments just to worship together. And after that, I want us to pray and believe God for miracles. I know it's a message from the Old Testament. (laughs) But the God of the Bible is the God of today. He's a miracle-working God. He's the God who heals. He's the God who delivers. I believe every time we gather together, whether it's in two or three gathered at home or whether we gather in a larger congregation like this, it's a time for us to invite God to heal, to deliver, to work miracles. And so I want to encourage you just to expect God. Maybe you came here this morning saying, God, I need you to touch my life. I need you to work a miracle in my life. Maybe it's a situation in your life. Maybe it's a healing in your body. Maybe it's Something that you need God to do a miracle in. We're going to pray. I want you to pray. Right after this song, I'm just going to pray with us. and Believe God for miracles. Believe God to touch us. To work miracles in us. Let's rise to our feet. The worship team will lead us, please. And extend your heart to God. And say, God, this is the miracle I need. I want to call our pastors up who are here with us. Please come, Benny Jean and Selena. Yeah, 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 Jesus. Miracle work in Jesus. You are a God. And you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name. And you deserve the glory and the honor.
of you watching online right where you are God's presence is there and even as we pray inside here in the auditorium right where you are expect the Lord to touch you if you need to pray you need to repent or you need to turn to God do that right where you are and we know that God will meet you right there and we don't always do this but I just want to in white, I just want to, you know, we call it traditionally an altar call. If you feel in your heart that today you want to return to the Lord. I'm not saying you're a big sinner or anything. That's not the point. But if you feel like, you know, I want to make a public statement that today I want to get back to God. I want to invite you to just leave your seat and come up to the front. Just as an express, not embarrass you, but if you feel that prompting in your heart, I want to go up as my expression of saying, Lord, I return, I come back. And I want you to do that and our life, lead, life group leaders will come and they'll pray with you as well. Is anybody, you feel like you want to do that in your heart? So I want to go up to the front. I want to pray. I want to tell God, I return. And I want to invite you just to, you know, leave your seat, come up. There is no embarrassment in this. There's nothing wrong. It's just you saying, being free in God's presence to say, God, I return. I want to do that. So if there's anybody here, you feel in your heart, that you want to do it. You want to come up to the altar. And you want to say, I return. Feel free to do that. Just come up and when, when people walk up, our life group leaders will be with you, to pray with you, and just, just to love you. That's all. This is not to condemn or judge any person. This is just to say, I return to God. And I want to be there where God wants me to be. Anybody, just feel free to do that. All right? And our life group leaders will be here to pray. At any time, just feel free to come up. We're also going to pray. Uh, for any need, any needs that I hear, we're going to pray. I'm going to let our pastors just speak any word that they feel that they should speak. Um, and uh, after that, you know, we're just going to pray a mass prayer for healing and for deliverance. So let's do that. Just go ahead, pray with them and come, come forward. Our life group leaders, please come. Just stand alongside these people. Just love on them. Just pray with them. Come, come. Uh, our life group leaders, please come. Just, just love these people. Just pray with them. Anybody else? You want to come? Just come. We can remove those, those, those white bands. Uh, you know, they're a little restrictive. Uh, just pray with these people who come. Just love them. Just pray for them. Okay? We're going to do that this morning. Just love people. Pray with people. Just love them. Pray for them. Whoever comes forward, you just, just love them and pray for them. Come. Come. We're, we're just loving people. They want to be where God wants them to be. So we're going to love them as they come. And anybody else, just, Joy, you can come and pray. Please pray. Anybody else, just pray for them. Pray for them. If we need somebody more, just pray for them. Pray for them, okay? All right. I'm going to let the pastors, please feel free. Uh, come to the center of the stage. Come on, please come. You can just feel free to share as, as you. Let's just open your heart. Let the Lord minister to people. Let the Lord minister to people. Just pray. Just pray. 
Just feel free. Just come, just be here. Our life group leaders will come to you, pray for you. Sangeeta, come. Just pray for them. Just pray for them. Come, pray for them. Daryl, come. Please pray. This side. Come. Vincent, come. Please pray. Just pray. Just pray for them. Just pray. Pastors, please feel free. Go ahead. Um, just feel uh, that the Lord wants to restore uh, even purposes that He had spoken uh, over some of us uh, long back. Um, and if, if that's you, if there, if, there are, if there are plans, if there are dreams that the Lord has spoken to you years back, I feel like the Lord is saying that He wants to restore that uh, even if you have abandoned them. Uh, and uh, if that's you, I just want to pray that uh, over you. If there's anyone who identifies with this, you can raise a hand. I just want to pray uh, over you. Father, I just declare a restoration, O oh God, of your purposes among your people, O oh God. Even, even the ones that have been abandoned, even the, even the ones that have been forsaken, for whatever reason, O oh God, Lord, we know that you're the faithful one who restores, who brings things to pass. God, and we, and we pray, Lord, that even as this restoration happens, oh God, that you would assure them, oh Lord, we, we speak the assurance of the Lord, the, the, that faith would arise, oh God, in their hearts to draw from you for these things, oh Lord. We thank you, oh God, you are faithful that you are with them, that you fill them, O oh God, with your strength, O oh God, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, O oh God. Oh, we just declare that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead, please. Anybody else? Just go ahead. Okay. Russian, come, come. Is there someone struggling with their identity? Okay. Go ahead. The Lord is saying, yeah. I am your father and I'm giving you an identity that you are the child of God and this identity will not be changed. You can identify yourself with me, with Jesus, because he has redeemed you. If there's anyone here struggling with your identity, there is a permanent identity that is unchangeable, and that's in Christ. And Jesus says that I have redeemed you, and I have paid a price and I've redeemed you. I am your redeemer. If there's anyone here in this auditorium struggling with your identity, we would like to pray for you. If you can raise your hand or you can come forward. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us you have paid a price and you have redeemed us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the work that you did on the cross so that each of us can identify ourselves in you and we can call you Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the redeeming power. Thank you for the relationship that you have with each of us. Thank you for that love, Lord, that is unending, unconditional. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Anybody else? Just go ahead. Let's do that. Quick, quick, quick. Go ahead. Um, this is just uh, going out to 
some of us who've been like Gomer, who've walked away very many times from God, especially in the areas of our mind. It's either daydreaming, fantasizing, imagery that isn't holy, which leads to further captivating illicit thoughts that lead to sinful behaviors within the four walls of our rooms. And just like we heard today, the Lord cannot let go of you. The Lord pursues you, yet he waits for you to turn back. So if that's something that you struggle with, you are struggling with, it's just a step back. It's just looking away and to the eyes of the Lord. So as you gaze into him, you will experience freedom. He asks of you to bring before him every thought and make it captive unto him and he will do the rest. So I just would like to just pray for each person who resounds to what was spoken. Lord, we declare and speak the clutches of these imageries, daydreaming, fantasizing, anything that is not of you. We break its bondage right now over the minds of your people. Father, we, we speak the freedom of the Lord Jesus over their lives, Father. Lord, when you set free, you have set free completely. Father, the next time, God, that they are in those situations, may they declare the name of Jesus as you speak the name of Jesus. You will see power come down and you will walk in freedom. Hallelujah. Lord, we declare this over people today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Anyone else? Go ahead. Just those of you who are suffering with a ear pain, uh, there's secretion coming out from your ears, or just constant pain in your ear, or just deafness that you're not able to hear clearly. We'll just pray for people here in the auditorium, those who are watching online. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just bind every spirit of infirmity that's causing that ear infection that's causing pain in the ears, secretions, God, coming out from that, that ear, the right ear, God. God, we pray for your healing hand yes. to just restore wholeness to Thank that ear, Father God. Yes. They will hear clearly, Father. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. But by your stripes, they are healed, Father. We speak your healing over that year, Father, in thank Jesus' you. name. Thank we you. speak wholeness. We speak restoration. We speak that pain to leave right now, God. Yes. Whatever is causing that infection, we ask to leave right now in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that every spirit of fear and anxiety and worry that is there because of that ear pain will also leave right now in the name of Jesus. Your peace that passes all understanding will be their portion, Father. We Amen. thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we believe that God is here as a restorer. Um, and he's, uh, he wants to restore relationships uh, very specifically. And um, it's just we're waiting on God. Get this image of a broken jar of vase and all the broken part of it when it's fixed together. I see all the broken end uh, part filled with gold. And um, that's the image that I get. And um, I just want to declare this over every area of your life where you think that you've messed up if you're here 
and and if there's any relationship that you think is beyond repair uh, beyond repair um, god is saying try me he's saying try me i am the god of impossible uh, i also feel very specifically that uh, the relationships uh, that hasn't gone right between parents and children uh, is being restored right now uh, when uh, this, this is scripture says when joshua was fighting and moses and uh, moses was praying and every time joshua was losing the battle uh, the reinforcement was sent to moses and i believe that um, the god is in the business of restoring the younger generation and we need the prayers of the older generation uh, and so father i thank you i thank you that you are here as a restorer lord there is no wound that is too deep there is no cut there's no hurt that is too deep that is impossible for you to reach down for you to stoop down and to fix and so father we invite you to come and do what you do best yes and restore and breathe over every relationship oh, that God. seems like it's beyond repair but oh, you are our restorer yes you are our restorer god yes. you are our restorer yes. father yes. Yes, and so we look to you oh, we yeah, look yeah, to yeah, you yeah, father yeah, maybe yes. like we we may be surrounded with situation where it seems like we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you because yeah. you are our restorer yes. father you Thank take you. pride in fixing things god and so here is our hearts before you laid yeah. bare nothing to hide before you so come and take your place come and do what you do best lord turn the sons towards the fathers and the fathers hearts towards their sons right now lord come and do a new thing in our thank midst you. thank you thank you jesus Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're just going to pray together. Father, we just thank you for every word that's been released, things that have been spoken. Father, we pray over every person, God, present in this place, watching online, at home, or wherever they are. We ask for the power of your Spirit to touch every life. Needs that that maybe we have called out from here, maybe, and there are many more that we haven't even spoken of, but God, you know every need. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, may there be healings, may there be deliverances, may there be great victories, may there be great miracles released into the lives of your people. May the impossible become possible in their life situations. Even as you spoke in your word, you will heal. You will love us freely. You will be like the dew, bringing, renewing and refreshing. We thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.